My name is Naomi Stead and I am Professor and Head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University. And um, this series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, is a collaboration between Parla and Monash. Um, of course, as always, we begin with the acknowledgement of country and I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of Parla, uh, the traditional custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of our Parla community. This is the 11th in the series Light at the End of the Tunnel, um, where we look into architecture as a profession, a discipline and a practice and how it will be affected and has been affected by the pandemic. This week, as a kind of celebration, it's a different format to what we usually do, and it's an open mic session. So uh, it's relatively unstructured. We're just going to have to see how this goes. Um, but I'm pleased to say that we have many of our uh, speakers from our previous sessions are joining us here. So Justine and I are planning to open by asking some questions of our previous speakers, and then we'll open to questions from the floor. So the practical stuff, as always, please make sure your microphone is on mute uh, unless you're speaking. Um, leave your camera on if you're willing. Um, we encourage people to do that because it helps us feel together as a community. Uh, the format, as always, is Q&A, informal but informative. Uh, Justine and I will try and keep things going and flowing, but as always, we'll take questions from the floor. So please put your question into the chat function and then um, we'll throw to you um, to put your question verbally to the group. Um, we can do that for you if you would rather not or if your microphone isn't working or whatever. Um, and as always, please feel free to add your own observations and experiences into the chat. Um, it doesn't have to be questions. It can be um, uh, reflections, insights. Um, we won't get to all the questions, but um, they will help to inform the topics of subsequent sessions. So, Justine. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, as Naomi said, this is um, a little bit of an experiment, but we thought that, you know, having 10 sessions under our belt, um, we would try uh, something a little bit different. And we've, we're conscious that we've got such an active and engaged audience that we um, thought the open mic session might be really interesting. Um, our colleague Susie, who's usually in the background fielding questions, isn't here today. So um, you just have to, uh, Naomi and I will be, be scanning those questions. Um, if you've got something you'd like to say in response to another question, please also put that into the, into the chat or just speak up or uh, this might be shambolic, it might be fun. Let's just see how we go. Um, we're very pleased today that we have um, quite a lot of our previous speakers have, have managed to um, uh, come back today. So we've got Kim Baisley, we've got uh, Gordana Milosevska, we've got uh, Sue Whittenham, Tanya Davidge, uh, our colleague Jill Mathewson, who who, guessed, who who hosted with with me one of the sessions. Um, anyone else I've missed? Um, and we've got uh, many of you, Misty Waters, did I say? Many of you um, have really been to lots and lots of these events, so um, uh, who we think of as our sort of stalwarts. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, and as Naomi said, we thought we'd start by um, throwing to the, the speakers, I think Jess is actually, Jess is also on her way, throwing to the speakers who, who we've, we've had before just with a little bit of time for reflection. And we presume that while we're doing that, you guys will all be uh, chucking questions into the chat. So Naomi, do you want to? Yes, um, Justin, do you think you could unshare your screen? so that we Oh, can sorry, sure. yes, goodness. All right, there is everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> yes, I particularly wanted to start by asking Misty, so some of you will remember that Misty Waters was our very first guest, that was 11 weeks ago, which seems like an eternity. Um, and at that time, it was all still pretty fresh and new. Uh, and Misty was, you know, trying to pull out patterns and observations from uh, a pretty live situation. So Misty, if I can ask you, um, what for you has changed since then, since 11 weeks ago? Have um, have you noticed other patterns? Have things that you thought were true then proven to have changed? What's What's been happening? Um, 
Thanks, Naomi. Um, I think it's it, it's hard to pinpoint. It's changing all the time and go. it seems very volatile. I think we were feeling a lot more confident two or three weeks ago that particularly in, I'm speaking mainly from Sydney's perspective, but p firms were hiring again. There seemed to be a bit more general optimism. And then with the numbers spiking again in Melbourne, that definitely had a knock-on effect here and add, kind of slowed things down a bit. Um, I mean, I do think... But it's not all bad. There's definitely pockets of busy practices. Um, and interestingly, it's really hard to pick the pattern who's busy and who's not. It's not, there's, it's really, it's a really unusual pattern. It's really hard to kind of say. Um, and I have, I know that um, the only other thing I've noticed this week is that a lot of the bigger practices who are finally getting most of their staff back into the office um, have now encouraged a lot of them have now decided to encourage their staff again to go back to working from home just to try and keep the numbers down mm -hmm. um and that was a shame because it was the, the smaller and mid-sized practices they were the first ones to come back and it was the bigger practices that were sort of slower to come back and i i just think that also slows down things like hiring mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and um jo well justin do you you had a question for misty about well, I do have a question because we're always really interested to know, um, particularly around redundancies, if there are um, gendered patterns playing out. Um, Jill and I have been busy uh, pouring through the survey data this week, um, and but we only have 40 people who were redundant in that, um, but it does so show a skew towards women. Um, and anecdotally, um, I've been having people contact me and say, you know, out of our practice, there were this many redundancies and, you know, a high proportion of them were women and particularly part-time women. So I just wondered if, I know you've got a very attuned antenna <laughs> that gendered patterns and I just wondered if you were seeing those or if we were just hearing the kind of worrying stories because those are the ones people bring. yeah I just I don't feel like I've got the, the enough data to be able to say I haven't particularly noticed that um and often when we we'll get calls from people who've been made redundant and they'll say oh I was one of 12 or I was one of 10 but they don't tell us who everybody else was so I don't it's hard I don't know I, I haven't noticed that num that tendency the thing I'm actually more worried about is more of the ageist problem I finding um, in terms of us helping people get new roles, um, the hardest people to help at the moment are people over, it's as low as over 45 almost. It's pretty, it's pretty scary. It, um, and especially those without software. So if I could, I'd be saying to the practices who are thinking about making any further redundancies, try and do the right thing and don't let those people go. Just cut down hours if you need to, but it's really hard for them to get a new role and, um, it's much easier for mid-level or junior people to get a new role at the moment. Mm. The other thing um, that I've had people ask me um, is, you know, again, part-time women um, hearing that practices are, aren't hiring anyone part-time. Um, I Certainly the people I then spoke to after that told me that's not true, um, yeah. but it seems to be a perception out there. Um, and the, the person I'm thinking of in particular sent me a message saying, you know, so I've got children, I work part time, I've been told I won't get another, I, there's no one's hiring people in my position, what am I meant to do, how do I stay in the profession, so I thought that might also be a question, I mean, we, yeah. Amy and I have been wanting to run a session on what to do when you've been made redundant, um, and I know Sue Whittenham's got comments on this as well, so that was a session that will come up, but I just wondered if anyone had any kind of... I just, I think on the part-time, I'm not finding that such an obstacle, as long as it's, it depends on the degree of part-time, but certainly four days a week is not an obstacle. A lot of practices here have already cut at least salaries down by 20%, and in many of those cases, they have reduced the hours by 20%, and, if every, and everyone's working remotely, so to convince someone to take on a good person four days a week, I think it's never been, I mean, it's hard to recruitment is low you know unemployment is high but generally I don't find the four-day week an obstacle as soon as you go down to three or two that becomes a lot more challenging mm. cool. all right yeah. should we whistle and I'm pleased to point out that Jess and um, Jean have both joined us as well welcome um, yeah I wondered if we might go to Jess next yeah. Jess <laughs> yeah, so, so Naomi, Jess wasn't here right at the beginning. So Jess, oh, okay. yes. well, we're, we're just running around the people who've spoken before and kind of asking um, 
what's changed in your world? <laughs> just a small question. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, and I, I was just uh, listening to, to Miss D's response there. And obviously, I, I think I was a bit of a doomsayer at our last uh, meeting where I was like, the second wave will happen. You need to future proof your businesses. If you think it's not going to, it will. And lo and behold, it's happened a lot sooner than what I imagined here in Melbourne. And I think it's only going to, um, you know, have that slow effect across at least the eastern seaboard, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks. So I think for me, um, not so much has changed, more a reality that this is a new way of working and practices need to embrace that, you know, we need to be agile and we need to be adaptive because the world has changed and it's going to continue to change. So to think that we can go and revert back to old practices old behaviours, old ways of thinking, I think is just fraught with danger, not only from a you know, people perspective, but just from a business survival perspective. Yeah. So um, I guess my position is that like all business owners, um, I think it's upon all of us to accept that the context has changed and we need to look at our models to see the opportunity that this brings. Yeah. And for employees, I would really recommend, you know, having some proactive conversations of where you can see opportunity to add value. Um, and that requires a, a different level of thinking than perhaps we've been used to in the past. But I wouldn't sit back. If you think there's a better way to do business for your practice, be vocal and step up because sometimes, you know, when you're in the business and you're working on the business, you can't see um, the trees for the forest, so to speak. So make sure if you're an employee, be proactive in saying what could be out there to make that practice more viable and to survive and hopefully thrive in the next months, years coming to us. So, so in relation to that, so as I said, Jill and I have been going through the data and one of the questions we asked was whether people saw an opportunity for permanent improvement to work and work cultures following COVID. And 97% of people gave an answer that was between, um, you know, kind of, sure sort of sure to yes there's stacks and stacks of potential and um i think 40 percent of people scored right in the very top end so i thought that was you know it's kind of really interesting on the one that you know so many people see so much potential so i guess that's the silver lining to some extent although the other side of it is gee the profession must be in a bad shape for it to need so much help but anyway <laughs> I think. I mean, Kim. I wonder if we could chat to you now about where things are, and 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 I know you've got lots of ideas about how things can change. I I'm a little bit uh, sort of remote from practice now, working as a design manager in a local council, so it's a little bit different for me. But I have to say that the probably the biggest change in the last. Um, eight weeks is just that shift from thinking, as Jess said, from thinking it's a, a, a one-off thing and just for a short period to being something that's a lot more permanent as a fixture. I think in that first period when we were thinking, oh, we're working from home, it's just, it's going to be okay. It was within the idea that it would only be for three months. And so now when we're looking at it, stretching out to six months or even 12 months, it's a, it's a very different cast on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, uh, I've just heard lots of anecdotes about, um, you know, within the industry, the extent of fee cutting that's going on um, between practices. Uh, you know, obviously practices are desperate to keep their good staff and, you know, that they're desperate to take work where they can get it. Um, and, you know, that's often at the expense of another, um, another uh, practice so you know that's that's pretty alarming mm -hmm. um, but yeah I think I think that the idea that we're not having an opportunity to go back to physical presence anytime soon is is it's a real game changer just mentally having to prepare yourself for that um, mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's my feedback but I don't I don't have a lot on on the whole notion of how you know the people coming in and um, getting roles. It's, uh, it's a different perspective that I have. Mm. Who is our next oldest uh, speaker, Justine? 
<laughs> I mean, earliest in the series of uh, seminars. Earliest in the series. I've lost. It's all a blur to me, Naomi. It's all just a big blur. <laughs> but I can see Tanya Damage sitting there. <laughs> I'm going to unmute. Hello. How is everybody? Um, what was the question? How are we all doing in oh, round no, two? Kind of more like um, after, you, after your last, you know, appearance within this group, um, have you had any reflections or thoughts and or, and or what has changed? Uh, you know, would you rethink any of the things that you said then, now, in light of what's happened subsequently? Probably not, but that was also probably a, a slightly more optimistic me. I think lockdown two has made it a little bit more difficult to find um, my optimism, but I think I'm I'm reconnecting with it again just in the past few days, which is nice um, because I do think it's been quite a, you know, it, it has, we thought we could get on top of it and we all kind of budgeted that kind of mental capacity for a certain length of time. And now we have to kind of re-find that budgeting. Um, so it's, so that's difficult. And I've been also reflecting recently a lot more on, um, I've been doing some research on housing and older women and, um, housing. And, um, so I've been reflecting a lot more on what the pandemic will bring and will mean in terms of kind of economic fallout, um, over the coming years. And, um, it's, it's not wonderful, um, but I think as women, we should probably pay attention to it. So what's happening in Australia is that women over the age of 45 are the largest growing cohort of homeless people. Um, and this happens because of structural inequity. Um, they don't present with uh, the same kind of issues as a lot of homeless people present with. Um, often the slide into homelessness for older women is... Uh, a long one and you can kind of see it coming and so um, and years of kind of structural inequity kind of the ri rising house prices uh, the gender pay gap um, response you know time out taken for responsibilities and caring exacerbate this um, and so the kind of pandemic is potentially really problematic in this area um, because it's an un unexpected I suppose it goes a little bit to what Misty was talking about before with um, the age of people who are um, being let go um, because it means it's kind of harder to find work after a certain age and at a certain age and it impacts on your kind of ability to save the future. So I suppose that's the depressing side of that issue but I think the positive side of that issue is that um, people are actually really starting to take notice that this is a huge issue. I think government is starting to try to work out how it might form part of pandemic recovery. Um, so I suppose with every crisis comes an opportunity and this is an opportunity to really talk um, about these issues and what they mean um, to us as women and what they mean to us kind of, I suppose, professionally even, because as we all know, we're architects are fairly ingrained in dealing with housing. So I'm hoping, um, that some really positive stuff will come out of a moment that's a little bit bleak at the moment, maybe. Sorry to be a tad depressing. Mm. And well, Tanya, we know that I, I happen to be privileged enough to know that you're working on something in relation to this and we look forward to a time when we can share it with everybody else. <laughs> yes, when it, when it hopefully, yeah, when it becomes a little bit more formalised, fingers crossed, I'm really hoping it gets off the ground because I think it could make a bit of a difference. But in the meantime, I'm trying to work on a little bit of advocacy um, in the area. So maybe um, once I get some stuff together, I'll send it through Parla and that would be wonderful if everybody would participate. <laughs> I think we've got a really great new business idea that's emerging emerging in the chat between Melanie Bale Smith and Sarah Hobday North. It's very exciting as well, micro design. <laughs> but should we um, should we next go to Sue Whittenham? Sue, what what do you what was your reflection on when you were with us last, and which was quite recent, in fact? Um, and did you have anything to add? And so I wonder if you might talk. I know we've had a private conversation where you pointed out you've been made redundant three times, and each time it's led to an opportunity. Um, so perhaps you might twice, oh, sorry, twice. <laughs> sounds dreadful. Um, no, well, multiple. It sounds like I'm getting careless, but when you've been, a, I mean, when you've 
been working for more than 30 years, then you're just going to not, you're going to be exposed to more things more regularly. But I was, I was reflecting on the two different circumstances. The first, the first one was um, five years out of uni and that was in the nineties. And I remember Justine, we talked about being caught up at, I mean, that, you know, almost there was nobody in the, in the late eighties, early nineties who wasn't touched by it in some way. I ended up um, just going back to uni and doing an MBA and it was incredibly positive because it was a whole career shift. But what was different too about that one was um, leaving on really good terms. I was working for um, Daryl Jackson, Robin Dyke in Sydney at the time and poor Robin was almost heartbroken when he was saying he just didn't have enough work for people and, and we had and was letting us go. But what it meant was that we could all stay there and and stay on a drawing board and just be in the office and be around and be supported mm -hmm. even though you weren't officially you know employed so there was a kind of a connection and a stability that came from that relationship and i was thinking that's what's really different this time around is that you know firms firms are just stuck if they haven't got the work if they can't build they can't keep people on but what what could happen and i was thinking too in the case of older people with you know less um, computer skills is that just being able to be around and be in the loop and be in the vicinity you're able to plug in and you're able to help with things that go right to the core of where you're best able to support a firm you know even if you're not um, somebody who can completely drive a project because if you CAD skills you've got wisdom you've got experience and you've got knowledge that you, you can support so how do we how do we help people or how do we think about ways that people can still be visible when in the circumstances of this particular pandemic, you know, we're not still around each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's one hard thing. We've lost place. The upside is I think what this series has shown is how rich a virtual environment can be on how people can still stay connected and how ideas can be teased apart and people can have a very rich conversation. And kudos to all of the team at Parlour for thinking through how you'll convene these dialogues and and how you'll take care to look after the people in the conversation and to position the ideas as well as you have so i think that you know again silver lining the fact that everyone's learnt and developed these skills over the last um 10 11 weeks um is wonderful to see and i think that's a real positive mm. Jess has got a great comment to make. Do you want to just make this very quickly, Jess, and then we'll move on to Gordana? Yeah, absolutely. So I was just um, noting, and I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed because I've forgotten the name of the author, but there was a great book that was brought out a couple of years ago around the new reality that I think we all need to adjust our mindsets to, and that is that we're all going to be living longer. And so there is a, a book out there that, that's, talk, that's spoken about around the 100-year life and the fact that we're going to be working until we're... 80, 85, 90. And so I think we all need to get used to the fact that this linear version of how we have run our life, you know, go to school, go to uni, get a job, retire, it's outdated. And if anything, this is showing us that we need to reposition ourselves as individuals to understand that we need to readjust that linear view and understand that it's a much more flexible, fluid model. And so I just want to put it out there and a little bit to Sue's conversation. Look at much we've learned in 10 weeks. If we could just put ourselves out there and realize that we're not looking for jobs as such anymore, but opportunities and opportunities comes in, come in different sizes and older workers, you know, unless you're over the age of 75, I think that's an inaccurate term to use these days. I think we just need to really reposition all of these things for us to see the opportunities for what they are. So that's my two cents worth. Thanks, Justine. Right. Excellent. Gordana, how are things going in your world? And, and, and have you seen any um, shifts? Yeah, thanks, um, Justine. So um, what's changed in the last um, few weeks is probably um, a note on JobKeeper 2.0. So um, for those business um, owners, um, directors of practices, uh, you probably need to have a chat with your accountants if you haven't already. But one of the things that um, or part of the government stimulus is that JobKeeper 2.0 has been implemented and 3.0, which essentially means uh, if your uh, turnover has um, reduced 
by 30% or more in the quarters ended June 20 and September 20. Uh, comparative to the year before, then you'll be able to tap into um, some further support from the government, um, which is great, whether or not the rules and or boundaries that they've set are ideal, probably not dissimilar to the first time around, there's, is questionable. And I think there's still a lot of lobbying going on um, around, you know, sort of tweaking, um, tweaking them so that more businesses are eligible. Um, that's probably a change that's occurred in the last few weeks. But in terms of advice around, um, you know, to, to business owners, practice owners, I think there's the, the same thing stands around knowing where your practice stands financially is fundamental uh, to effective decision making. So knowing the difference between uh, profit and cash flow, knowing how to read income statements and balance sheets. Uh, knowing how much money to have in uh, your bank account. And I talked to the fact that we need four to six weeks, at least in this environment um, of costs. Uh, cash is the lifeline of business. So uh, more important now than ever before. Um, uh, pulling together budgets right about now, which is what we're doing for our clients and most practices would be, um, is very difficult. It's like, who knows what's going to happen in the next three to six months. Typically, our projects are such that we can see maybe three to six months, sometimes longer, of course, depending on uh, the size of the practice, size of the projects. Um, but right about now, it's so difficult to be able to predict what's going to happen. So having a few variations or iterations of budgets moving forward is probably um, uh, ideal. And then as employees, ensuring that uh, you understand the budgets that are set around your projects. Uh, or knowing if you don't have a budget for your project, budgeted hours, you know, putting your hand up, asking the question, what are my budgeted hours? What are the hours I need to be working towards to ensure that um, you're assisting and supporting the practice you're working for so that at least the projects that you are working on uh, or project that you're working on comes in within budget. So albeit work, work may be scarce, moving forward, uh, at least the jobs that we're currently working on, we can all do our bit by working within, within budgets. And as I say, if um, you're unaware of what these are, put your hand up and ask the question. There'll be someone there that can support you in your practice. And then of course, um, yeah, getting your time sheeting, as I, uh, I mentioned last time, obviously that, that helps you get paid. Uh, but also it supports the practice in that we're then um, able to compare actual hours against a project compared to budget. How many more hours do we have left? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think, Jean, Jean, I know you were only with us quite recently, but <laughs> has anything changed in your world? <laughs> uh, I think a few things. Um, I'm particularly thinking more about how we're going to run our practice for three years like this, as opposed to six months. And there's no more couple of weeks away anymore. I don't think we're gonna get a, um, well, who knows, something could happen, but I don't think there's gonna be a vaccine for three years, which means we could be stuck like this for three years. And so what does that mean as a business and how do we work like that? And if you think that way, then it means you have to force these changes into the company because you can't go back to the way it was. It won't be that way ever again. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a different thing. So I think that what that means for us is, um, you know, I'm really thinking hard about, you know, um, it was as simple as when we took the printer away three years ago. Now we have to physically go uh, two kilometres to go get it printed. You know, we have to walk there. And so you make a big deal about it and you do it once a week and it's kind of annoying. But now we're sort of limiting it and we hardly even print anymore. I mean, we do often need to print for certain things, but what it's making us work harder to do is waste less. And so it's sort of like if you can't have it, it's not accessible, you change your ways to make it work. Like to the point where I'm even wondering whether we need physical files anymore. Like I think if we can have a digital archive that might be even preferable. Um, and really trying to... Um, meet with even though it's really hard and meet with clients online and try and make that work um, so I'm really trying to work with the team to try and work on that and how we can communicate better online and perhaps it means a bit more pre-planning pre 
So instead of working the night before for a presentation the next day, we might have to work a week before and then get it sent to them and then watch them open it so that they can have it in front of them, whether it be a physical model and drawing so that we can explain it through at the same time. So that's what I'm going through at the moment. So I'm just trying to think about how we can be more flexible. And also, you know, as a woman, if I do decide to have children, I'm going to be faced with um, time pressures. And I think that uh, when everyone was talking about this over 45 years old thing, it's just terrific to me because women are the most vulnerable people and um, knowing that they can't get employment or they might have to be stuck in horrible relationships in order to maintain housing and living equal living standards just breaks my heart. That's not the world I want to live in. So I think we all need to, as employers and as um, you know, people in the community try and encourage women and try and support women, even, you know, this shit job sharing thing, like we, we were talking last week about the graduates, perhaps it's a shared role between two women. And, and then, you know, it probably, probably makes sense too, if, if um, work isn't as good for everyone at the moment, um, you can have one one per staff member on less projects and more in control so it could actually be better for the company so yeah that's that's kind of where i am mm. not really you know thinking about um cash flow and things but also trying to relay to clients that i'm not going to change our fee structure we're not going down in cost so if they don't want us they want to go somewhere else that's fine it will take as long as it takes and it will cost what it costs if they can't handle that, they, that's, they're not the client for us. And I think if we all try and hold our ground, then we shouldn't have to be undercutting each other. And, and it's, I know it's the old 80s way of um, undercutting each other to stay in business and get rid of everyone else, but I think we need to hold um, a unanimous front. And I think, it, um, I think we can do it. And I think clients don't want to do the wrong thing. I think they want to you know, support um, creatives so if we just relay what that, those under cost, uh, undercutting measures mean, I think they'll be acceptable. And if they're not, then they can go somewhere else. <laughs> that's just, that's, these are the things I've arrived at in a week, which <laughs> sounds a lot. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't agree more, Jane. <laughs> Kim? I, I think um, it's interesting because I think that's, I, I don't know about small clients, but I think it's definitely true of institutional clients that they are, um, they are definitely looking for value out of this because their budgets are under pressure as well. So developers and, and sort of large, uh, you know, government, whatever, well, governments are a bit more kind of isolated from it because insulated from it because they don't, you know, once their project's endorsed and they've got the funding set aside, that that project can proceed. But certainly I've heard from um, owners of, of medium to large practices that they've got clients coming back and asking them for their post COVID price, not their pre COVID price. And that is on existing commission. So they're looking to renegotiate existing um, service agreements. Um, and that that's really alarming um, that, you know, that, that um, developers are looking for that kind of value gain when really as a percentage of their total spend, it's a very minor amount, but that, that is what's happening. And it's what value is, right? What we, yeah, value is not just money. Anyway, I could rant, so I'll stop. Naomi, Justine, whether we might. Um, there was a good question ages ago from uh, Badru Ahmed about to Misty about um, uh, levels, the levels at which people are possibly being made redundant, and whether pay scale has an impact on that. Badru, are you still there? Do you want to um, put your question? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. No, um, just uh, regarding what Misty was saying that um, there's a lot of redundancy for the mid-level, uh, but do you think that's also because, you know, young grads are cheaper to hire and with a little guidance, they sometimes, not saying that they totally can, but sometimes with a bit of guidance and oversee, they can deliver the um, stuff which, you know, the office might think that a mid-level person can deliver. And also there is the factor of the software. And often young grads, you know, five or six softwares, you know, do you, um, do you think that has something to do with why a lot of the mid-level staff is being 
um, redundant? <clears throat> Uh, no, not really, because I think particularly with remote working, people are less likely to bring in someone too junior because they don't want to have to train them up. So if you've already got the software and you know the projects, um, I, I, you know, I don't think you'd be, I don't think they'd bother going through that redundancy and then hiring. Um, but I do think, you know, when you're doing, I've been on the side, other side of the table where you're deciding who to make redundant. It's a terrible decision to have to make. And um, you take a lot of things into consideration. So, I mean, yeah, I don't think I don't think many people are making redundancies with the view to then replacing with a lot of cheaper staff. I think you know they they might be make asking staff to take a pay cut. And certainly, what I do see is now when they do rehire, anyone that is rehiring is looking for a COVID discount to the salary. That's for sure. And they're certainly asking us for a COVID discount on anything we do for them. So there is that kind of opportunism, I guess. But I don't, yeah, I don't really think people are being made redundant to just so they can get in a cheaper grad because it's not good economy anyway. So but no. if, it, if it was a choice between, let's say, having a cheaper staff, like retaining a cheaper staff, or retaining a you know mid-level pay staff, do you think that pays a role? Oh, probably, yeah. I mean, you take all of that into account, but um, typically the difference between, a, you know, someone with two years and five years isn't that big a difference in salary really if you're looking for the big savings the easier saving is to get rid of someone very senior i don't know yes. yeah okay thank you thank yeah. you okay what do you want to do naomi sorry i've got i've got a bit of background noise here um it's all right um, 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 um blah, 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 blah. well should we should we throw to um to mel to mel and um uh, um, Sarah Hobday North, who are having some interesting conversation about micro design in the um, chat forum. Do you want to? And Mal, I know you you've been to quite a few of these, so it's good to have. Hello. Uh, yes, and Sarah and I have been having some chats off and on, or offline and online, and so forth. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, my recent whinge has been about just the difficulty in bringing. Uh, inquiries and clients and this is not just can I just say not just residential clients these are also some community clients and different people we've been in contact with over the last few months and it's interesting to see how um, the pandemic is kind of prompting different people to think about starting a project whereas you would think everyone just wants to go and become a hermit and not spend any money and so we're seeing you know some different people come forward but I think um, I think a lot of people uh, very, there's, there's, in spite of all of the TV shows, good and bad, that are out there and all the magazines and all of the websites, there's still an incredible lack of understanding about what architects do, but also just what is the process? You know, we find ourselves talking about the process and I think um, to try and bring people a bit closer to the process and not feel so in awe of it or what is, what is my hard my hard earned money going to pay for? Um, it's breaking it down. And I think um, the whinge that I had in the last week or so was that, you know, I've got almost 25 years of experience behind me and I'm finding it harder to sell my services and my practice than I did when I was a young gun, you know, kind of trying to sell myself as having more experience than what I had sort of 15 years ago. And so there's, a, there's an interesting collision there between expertise, the runs you have on the board and what you're offering. And so we're trying to break down the impenetrability and look at how can we offer services in a micro way, not just small projects, which is what Sarah and I were talking about there, um, and engaging with micro designs and small changes, but also how can we break down that process and allow people a, a better entryway into starting to work with an architect? Because I just, I. It's at the point where even talking with people about a concept design and what we do at our concept design stage, which admittedly might be more than other architects, and that's fine, um, but just trying to get it to the point where we're actually just saying to people, let's talk about what your brief is. Let's talk about the key parameters and let's not even get too head up with the design at the moment because you need to actually frame what it is you're doing before you start kind of throwing your Pinterest board at me. <laughs> so this is so this is about breaking down the language, breaking down the barriers that, that are there because we can think that people have an idea because 
they're engaged with Howes and Pinterest and they watch grand designs, but actually they're still in some ways no more informed than anyone else was 10 or 15 years ago. So I think it's dangerous for, for us to think that there's an assumed knowledge just because there is so much more information out there now than there was previously. So this is, so this is something that's been my own frustrations and I've been working through and then, you know, there's been some interesting discussions online on Twitter, Sarah and I've been involved with around fees and value and, and how do you communicate value? Sarah might want to talk to that though. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I agree and disagree with bits of that, Mel. That, that, um, so for Open House, I was in a panel discussion about the impact uh, or the fiction reality of reality TV, the fiction and the truth. Um, and there, in urban design, there's a term, the missing middle, which refers to housing. But I think in architecture and the design process, there's a missing beginning and middle because all these shows focus on the end. Um, and hence, that's what that's why you're we're all getting flooded with the Pinterest board um, before the questions and the what do we build, not the how do we build it and what does it look like um, get answered. Um, hence, why I, I think I think there's a shift, or that it's an opportunity for architects to be, be to push and make more visible those fronts. Oh, sorry. Dropping. And the pressure. The oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The is, is that in? I think it's your internet, any, Sarah. You better, uh, Justine. A little bit. Oh, bother. You bit dodgy. Well, we'll blank. My in. I've just officially been told my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> right. Anyway. Oh well. Um. <laughs> yeah. So okay. There's lots the of technologies on. against me today. <laughs> Yeah, well, the chat's working for you though. Um, I wonder if we could throw to um, whoever is here joining us from Kirby Architecture, who's making some interesting comments in the chat as well. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. So um, the question about guidelines around flexible working. Yeah, really, I haven't been able to attend many of these really because Friday's my day off. It's the day to get stuff done both at home and for the, where I turn off the phone at work. So I tend to 12 o'clock, you know, tends to just disappear very quickly in whatever I'm engrossed in. Um, I'm really interested in what you guys are doing. Uh, when I talk about guidelines and um, there is so much that we can actually, as architects, we solve problems. That's what we do best. And we do it not just in the design. We look at the whole picture. And I think that's really important. We look at who the end user is going to be, who the client's going to be, who's going to be put at risk during um, the process of designing, of building, of the completed product. We are the glue that holds everything together. I think, um, and I really believe firmly that we can start to drive both flexibility, how, how to work flexibly um, in the environment. Uh, and I suppose I was just putting it out there that I'm really willing to work with everyone to, to develop some guidelines. Now, there are a whole lot of areas. That's, that's the framework about how businesses run. That's the framework about how we communicate with our staff. I mean, I've, we've got a staff member in New Zealand. She hasn't been into the office yet. Um, but it, it's how you make sure you keep that connection going. Um, the blurb, sorry, it's all spilling out without <laughs> <laughs> being too formal. It's, um, and I think there's such a, I've loved listening, there's such a plethora of knowledge here that you really could set up those small areas to just start to work on those guidelines. Mm. Um, yeah, businesses, legislation, um, how you work from home, you know, the blurred lines between um, your, your office personality or what used to be when you went into the office, you left a lot of home behind now you don't get to you know home is here sitting you know walking down the hallway with you at the same time um, where, where do we sit with all of those how do we help our staff to understand that as well i'm so sorry that's more that's more than you wanted and perhaps a bit of feedback 
<laughs> no, it's great. I mean, these are the kinds of discussions that we're having a lot of. And, and you know, at Parlour, we're quite partial to a guideline. <laughs> and I think the idea of kind of, um, you know, they take quite a lot of work to put together. So I think the idea of sort of crowdsourcing to some extent yeah. that kind of, um, you know, the, the advice around that, which is what we did with those parlour guides years ago, that we put them out to consultation. Um, but I think, um, I think that's a great idea. I mean, we've been publishing a lot of kind of um, reflective sort of personal profile-y kind of pieces online, um, which is people seem to, you know, which have been very helpful. But yeah, collecting that into a kind of guideline-y format is a good idea. And I know you mentioned the ACA and, and Susie yeah. and I have a hotline to them as well. So um Look, I stood on the committee there. Um, I'd really, I think there is so much value to be gained from working. You know, which has, branch? Um, Victoria, Melbourne. How are you? Yeah, ah. Victoria, yeah. It's good to know. <laughs> Misty, you have something to add to this conversation? Um, yes, I was. I was just remembering that um, I judged a while ago uh, a best in practice prize for the AIA. Justine remembers mm -hmm. and remember BVN one and they were going to, sh I'm sure they would have, but they, cause they had very good kind of policies around flexible working. This yep. is pre COVID. So they're probably busy updating that again. Um, but they were going to share that as a mm. gift, as a gift sort of back into the industry, weren't they? I don't know where that got to. They are, I mean, they were right. They, they'd organized an event, which was, you know, steal all your, steal all our good ideas kind of event I think they were calling it and we were working with them on that and that was one of the casualties of COVID um, mm. but no they're doing really remarkable work um, and again as part of MCC with Jess so um, uh, yes I will hit Brian up for that. Yeah I mean I think a lot of the big practices have now formalized policies around flexible working or all yep. flex or we can all flex um, so yep. there would be good information you could cherry pick I'm sure. Absolutely. Mm. Yes, you look like you wanted to say something there. Absolutely. And so a couple of things on that point. Um, so the MCC organisations are going to be releasing a report late this year that will have a lot of the guidelines that you were just talking to, including some more in-depth details sitting behind where it actually means from a business and an employee perspective to work flexibly. So um, I'm just letting you know that they're busy pulling all of that stuff together at the moment and it will be shared not only on the MCC website, but through Parla and Justine as well. And it's accessible for everybody. So um, we've got uh, practices from all scales contributing to that. So uh, watch this space, it'll be accessible by November and there's some amazing work that BVN and other practices are doing like Woods Baggett, um, that are taking it to a new level, including smaller practices as well. So um, we've heard it and we're working on it and it's definitely coming. Mm. And likewise, I was in a meeting the other day with the people from the MCC who are looking at mentoring and developing resources that will support, you know, build on the parlour guide. So that's kind of exciting as well. For those of you who've got your camera on, it's really helpful because if you do a little sort of wave or a little funny look, we can work out you want to say something too. So um, if you do want to pipe up, um, put your camera on as well. Naomi, where are we at now? I've lost well, I was just going to make an observation, Justine. I mean, my, I, I don't dare to make suggestions and commit parlour to things <laughs> on the fly. But I'm just thinking about, um, actually, this relates to what Jean was saying a minute ago about, you know, the things that we used to take for granted, we can no longer take for granted. There's a kind of estrangement or defamiliarisation, let's say, of the ways that we used to do things. And then everything now has to be rethought, which means moving beyond what, we're our, what we thought were necessities, but turned out just to be... Um, preferences and we now realize they weren't necessities in fact we can learn new ways of doing things anyway my point was going to be um, I wonder whether there could be some kind of crowdsourcing moment you know like even if it's a Google Doc because I'm thinking I'm sure that what Jess is saying about the documents that have been prepared by Vivian and others will be really outstanding but also there'll be people in this group who have very specific and very particular um, experiences um, which could be very useful if shared. And I mean, of course, the example I'm thinking of here is the um, crowdsourced uh, shitty architecture men list, which is not what we would be doing, but nevertheless, it was crowdsourced, you know, globally um, in a new model of um, sort of interactive um, information sharing. 
Um, anyway, maybe we can do that because I'm sure that uh, BVN and others are doing a great job of kind of policy at policy level, but there's, there's something that comes from the experiential bottom up uh, lived experience of people with their own particularities that could be really, really helpful to share, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that's right. I think, you know, at Parlour we tend to kind of, I mean, those Path Ahead series have been really fabulous, but they're kind of written pieces and they take a lot of crafting. There's there's some examples in the kind of research, in the academic and research world that I've seen around, um, I don't know, approach, I can't remember from anthropology i can't social social sciences i've seen you know people shared google spreadsheet yeah you know, google docs that have been a whole lot of material written into by many many different people i think it's a great idea um we probably need someone to shepherd it and that person might not be me <laughs> yeah. i mean it's actually for me it's been really pronounced even during the pandemic period because when the black lives matter um movement uh, was starting in the US and then obviously spreading across the world, including to Australia, there were a lot of shared curriculums that were being developed via Google Docs. You know, the work of 20, 30, 40, 50 people working into a document mm -hmm. and sharing resources um, in a very generous open source kind of way, uh, which, which we could possibly contribute to here. We'll have to talk about that offline. We'll have to talk about this offline, but if anyone wants to put their hand up to help, <laughs> <laughs> we're open. <laughs> okay, where are, where are we? Oh, we've got six minutes to go. Where are we at? <laughs> um, mm, well, I mean, I actually, well, Jean, Graham, can we come back to you and ask you more about that question about, you know, the thing, the ways in which we used to do things, which were rules of thumb and habits, I guess, or routines or um, just custom in many ways, and that it's been a heck of a lot of work to rethink that, but that there's good things to come out of it. That's more or less your argument, is that right? Yeah, I, and I think it's, I'm, I'm a big, um, I'm the worst person in, in our company because I always want to re revert to what I know is the most efficient. Um, problem is, it isn't always the most efficient. If you know how to do it, if you learn how to do it once, you can actually do it quicker. So we've had this many conversations in house. Um, we're doing free, we've had people all over the place anyway, and then now now because of COVID, they're even more spread out. But we have daily meetings, and in our daily meetings, we talk a little bit about how we can try and connect more and better. And so coming out of that is that we're going to have more group training and more group sharing of experience and knowledge. So we're all frustrated, we all find it hard, we're all really tired, things are getting pushed around and we don't really know where we're going. And I think the most critical thing to think about is like you use it like you're cleaning out, I don't know, sounds really ridiculous, but you're eliminating all the, the past that you don't want anymore and you're creating a new future that you want. So if you're gonna select a few items from your wardrobe that you're gonna take with you, what are they? So think about it in a project sense. What are the few items you wanna take with you and, and get rid of the rest? You know, getting rid of the flannel shirt, it's no longer in my life. So that means I'm not having a printer done. Good. And maybe it doesn't all happen today. Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe you have a three year plan where you start to enact these things and you weekly chip away at things like, oh, I want to have a better online library. I want to have everyone up to date with Revit. I want some training because I don't know what I'm doing. I want to make sure everyone can be capable in business management, knows how to read a balance sheet. And we have a business coach. So there's sort of like more, it's kind of like training or CPD, but ways to make your life better or easier. And perhaps a lot of you already have these skills and perhaps it is parlor or something like this where we share it. But I think it's also where we don't just listen to it as a boss or as uh, an individual. We actually share it with our team. Mm -hmm. That's the missing element. Like we need to communicate within our team so that we all have the knowledge. Mm. Yeah, and I guess uh, that was one of the things that came out of, um, Jean, your conversation with Sue. Uh, Sue, you were talking about practices becoming much more intentional in terms of how they operate themselves and really thinking through processes anew. Is that right? Yeah, I, well, it's, it's when whatever has happened by default is no longer physically possible, then, you know, that's, that's the deep end nature of this, is that it's not a, it's not a discretionary... Uh, or it's not sort of pick and choosing what will we play with. It's like, if you don't bloody figure it out, then, you know, people work doesn't get done and people don't stay connected. So there's that, um, you know, you just have to think through and make it work. So there's that um, non-negotiable hygiene factor, how are we going to stay connected? 
Um, and then there's the just what was triggering when jo, um, Jean was talking about the things that she wanted to keep as opposed to the other ones. And, um, you know, that bloody awful Mari Kondo just um, flicked into my mind and Kimberly's mind at the same time. So um, <laughs> that idea of thinking about where where is there something beyond the hygiene, something that actually um, is transporting and is delightful and is some way of, of reconnecting. And one experience I had of that was um, in a group of facilitators, um, uh, Viv McWaters and Johnny Lee do a lot of training about facilitation in, in, um, uh, in groups. And they've pivoted to thinking about um, how you can convene groups and have conversations online that are full of humour and heart and um, whimsy and delight. And they've had the most delightful series of, um, of training events, which have been playful um, and of which have created... And, and again, you know, 20 years ago, we would have thought, oh, no, you can't make any kind of connections online. You know, virtual doesn't count or virtual doesn't create community. When, of course, we know that that it's tremendously powerful in terms of um, creating community. Um, well, the creative facilitation team proves that even Zoom can be playful and whimsical um, and create great connections. Um, and so even thinking about conferences. I wouldn't want to go to a conference that wasn't a real conference where you could have a chat. Well, it turns out you can have amazing, make amazing connections with strangers in random breakout rooms when you throw people together and just let them talk. So there are unexpected bits of delight that crop up in all of, in all of this. Mm, you know, I think that's a fabulous note. Um, we, in fact, are exactly on time. And I think it's a fabulous note to end on because I have to say, certainly for those of us who are in Victoria, um, delight seems to be in pretty short supply during the um, second lockdown. It feels very grim, I must say. It feels grim. It feels like we're grinding along and it feels like we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So um, everyone really does need to keep that in mind. There has to be, you've got to find the joy and the pleasure where you can. We need to find the glow worms that are in the tunnel. <laughs> Love an overextended metaphor. Misty, did you have something you wanted to add as a sort of last word? No, no, sorry. I, did, I totally agree. I thought it was a really nice way to end, Sue. Thank you. And um, maybe, Naomi, go and read. Are you, have you read Phosphorescence? That's quite nice. It's oh, yeah. Well, joy in it. I like Phosphorescence. <laughs> that's quite good. Yeah. I feel so bad for you people in Melbourne. It just, it's terrible. Yeah. Well, I want you, thinking of you insiders to be going out as much as you can while you still can, obviously in a safe way, for us. For us. Oh, we already feel like we probably shouldn't be because it's creeping up here too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I hope it goes soon. Well, thanks, thank everyone. You everyone. Like, I had no, I just thought, I think it was at four o'clock in the morning one day last week, I thought, let's do an open mic. <laughs> so, um, I'm very happy that everyone came and participated and it felt very, uh, felt like a really nice kind of um, little break in that kind of series of events. And um, so thank you all very much. Um, and I do, um, I do think that we, you know, these kinds of um, online discussions are becoming more and more productive. And um, we had the second uh, Midday Monday session for students and young grads this week, and it was it went incredibly well. And so I think again, once we kind of as we familiarise ourselves with these, and, and in that case, everyone breaks into little breakout rooms of four to five people, um, and it's led by Sarah Mayer and Bronwyn Main. And I think Bronwyn's here. Hi, Bronwyn. Um, so that's gone very very well, and I think we're just continuing to develop ideas about how we can use these platforms and use the community that we've got to kind of keep um, increasing connection um, uh, so yes mm. thank you everyone thank and you everyone